Bell unveiled its Nexus eVTOL Air Taxi concept earlier this year at CES, but we had the chance to catch up with Bell's VP of Innovation, Scott Drennan, at Heli Expo 2019, where he told us all there is to know about the project at this point. This is a long-form video for those of you who want to drill deep into the future of eVTOL and air taxis from Bell's perspective. Let us know what you think in the comments. So Nexus is a powered lift aircraft with six fully tilting ducts. Uh, so it flies in its current configuration as a helicopter and then in its converted configuration like an airplane. We chose this redundant configuration to use redundancy to get to the reliability numbers that we need ultimately for certification. There's been this interesting conversation in this market space about how redundancy automatically, so to speak, equals reliability. But as we all know, being in the industry, um, that's not necessarily the case. Sometimes you can have reliable systems that are non-redundant, like we do in traditional helicopters, the mast, the blades, etc. And then systems on those helicopters that are redundant, like flight control computers or actuators, but both have the same purpose, and that is to create reliability. So um, this is a vehicle that has more redundancy than our traditional vehicle, uh, and so therefore relies on it to get to the reliability numbers rather than reliability of individual components, although that will have to be there as well, uh, but not at the same level that we normally certify to. Um, you'll see the cabin is in a four plus one configuration right now and translated into payload, 800 to 1,000 pounds of payload. We say four plus one because we're leaving room for the pilot to be there in the beginning of the certified operation models, both in case there's still regulatory questions, but also because we believe our customers might demand that from the initial flights. And then once we get the data there and the you know, societal or community acceptance, we'll take that plus one and turn it into another paying customer inside the vehicle. The vehicle's gross weight, it, we're targeting somewhere in the six to 7,000 pound range, all with the idea of staying below a Part 29 type certification um, and using certification um, knowledge and experience that we initially developed on the 609 with the um, certification basis we wrote for that vehicle. Um, but then, of course, trying to take advantage of the new performance-based specifications in Part 23, which we believe are quite applicable to an aircraft like this, and, and in some of our initial studies to date have, have turned out to be really good. So the, the time frame that we're offering uh, is about the time frame when we believe a certified operational vehicle can be out serving the public, and that, we believe, is in the mid-2020s, mm -hmm. so the middle of this, uh, this decade. Um, in, in terms of our first flight, uh, we're not disclosing when, but you can, you know, kind of string together between now and 2025. We don't have a lot of time, so it's uh, <laughs> it's coming up. What uh, lessons have you learned from the V-22 and the tilt rotor to yeah. transfer to this? Yeah, thank you. It's all, it also includes not only the, the powered lift vehicles of the V-22 and the V-280, but it even goes back earlier in our history to the XV-22, where we flew a four-ducted, tilting-ducted uh, vehicle, and we learned a lot there about ducts and um, disc loading. Um, then for, the, for both that vehicle and the V-22 and V-280, of course, we know everything there is to know today about the conversion corridor and we'll be applying that learning here and then the difference dynamically between flying like a helicopter and flying like an airplane and and everything that happens during that conversion so that's been really uh, helpful learning Conducted aircraft just haven't made it right so you know, what's the difference now so um, what what's interesting about past technology that people have incubated mm -hmm. is that Back then, there were other things that didn't exist, like fly-by-wire, the actuators of today, the EMAs. Um, and then we also knew we needed to help get the most efficient vertical takeoff and landing machine that laid in because of the desire for our customers to have more electric vehicles. So that more electric vehicles translates to us as less power available. 
and therefore we have to make a more efficient aircraft and the ducts really help us with the VTOL portion of the mission because they augment the thrust across an open rotor. Both the V-22 and the V-280 are fly-by-wired powered lift vehicles in the form of a tilt rotor. This is a powered lift vehicle in the form of a tilting fan vehicle, uh, but everything we learned about uh, fly-by-wire and control uh, applies to this as well. With a few more challenges because it's a little different than a tilt rotor. But. <laughs> so, uh, right now there's lots of major cities that are re re uh, restricting helicopters flying over mm -hmm. the cities certain heights and other yeah. So how are you addressing that? So we're addressing that primarily with noise. So the, the vehicle that we have here has um, much lower tip speeds than we're all accustomed to on traditional helicopters. Um, tip speed is the primary driver of noise, both on the tail rotors and the main hubs of a traditional helicopter. And then the second piece that we have are the ducts. The ducts are really doing a great job shielding uh, the noise, changing the tonality of the noise, and also giving us a lot of directionality. Um, the noise on, this, on, the, on the ducts is distinctly different on all the azimuths. Um, and that, if we couple that with the right operational models, it's going to really blend in nicely to urban, urban ambient noise. Yeah. What about flight in icy conditions? So we're, we're, we're studying the, the, the possibility of all weather conditions. It's critical in this, uh, this market because the expectations are to fly, you know, up to 2,000 hours per year. That's relatively rare in the helicopter fleet today and so in order to really do that and let the business case close we're gonna to have to address all weather conditions we're not doing that with our demonstrator vehicle but we're studying it uh, of course it has to be lighter more cost-effective and less of an energy hog than traditional um, de-icing systems are on on traditional vehicles how do you manage the failure of the engine yeah the the Nexus currently has a single engine um, series hybrid with a battery pack on board. That battery pack serves two functions. It serves to help with transients and power, mm -hmm. and it serves to land our customers under full power and full control should we experience an OEI event. It's roughly four to, four to five minutes, very okay, similar okay. to the time it takes a 407 to auto-rotate and get to the ground. What kind of engine is it? Have you it's a Safran. Uh, Safran does the um, the gas turbine, the yep. power uh, uh, distribution system, uh -huh. and the electric motors. And then a company called EPS, Electric Power Systems, does our energy management and batteries. And if you lose one fan? Well, yeah, we would plan, plan to be fine there. Yep. 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 And, you know, remember with distributed um, solutions, you don't get just to turn off one you usually have to turn off turn off the other one on the other side to get oh, really? the aircraft balanced and that that applies to any oh, of I these kind of vehicles so what can, what system or component are you most concerned about um, I it's really the battery and motors but not from a technology standpoint our partners know how to deal with that technology it's from the weight standpoint because as soon as the and they're they're continuing to evolve but as batteries and motors get lighter and lighter, more energy dense or power dense, however you want to classify it, um, that is going to be a, just a great evolution in these vehicles. Better missions, more missions, longer missions. And uh, that, that, I think that's the best, the biggest challenge we have. Power electronics are heavy as well, but... Uh, How much would be turnaround time to charge batteries? So we haven't done any integrated system tests with the partners there, but there are uh, ChargePoint and uh, Uber are talking about five to seven minute uh, charge times. That is now, that is in a system whereby you're doing, you're not bringing the battery all the way down to, you know, low states of charge. You're doing, you know, shorter bursts of, you know, 25 miles at a time, 80% state of charge back to the charge and, and then and out again. And that, that, that'll come with a, some cooling of the battery system. That'll be a combination of what's on board and off board on the, in the infrastructure. Any particular cities that you think this would be deployed in first? 
Yeah, I mean, I think there are cities um, that we've heard about from from uh, uh, Uber, Dubai, Dallas, Los Angeles. There's still a lot to be seen about what can we do in the certification environment in the U.S. and how hard those cities want to drive with us versus what we can do in other municipalities that have a different certification arrangement, either in Europe or in places that control their own airspace. They could help. They could help with the with the time period. How much is Bell put toward this program? So I can't I can't quote numbers of my IR&D spend, but uh, my team has grown over the last three years from my 25 original folks that I knew from my history at Bell, and we're at 100 and. 20, 30 right now. I'm probably going to grow to about 175 people by the end of this year, just on my engineering innovation design team. This, to me, this is more familiar from an interior standpoint than than anything that you would experience in a traditional helicopter. It has more of an automobile feel. There's connectivity um, for devices. Um, there's a very um, you know compartmentalized, sleek look to that, and. Um, we also have a really simple cockpit display here. This is our Garmin display. Really aimed at, think about simple, simplified vehicle operations that combine just the information you need plus very simplified control effectors. We're still experimenting with the format of the control effectors, yeah. but we know we won't be doing pedals, collective, and cycling. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have a wonderful program called the Future Flight Controls Program that um, we built three simulators and we put people through the simulators and there's a data algorithm behind it that Texas A&M does for us to determine the relationship between that person's training and familiarity with flight and that person's success on the course inside the simulator mm -hmm. and it determines, it tells us what controls are most intuitive to non-professional and professional users. You'll notice a flat floor um, so these seats and these center consoles can come out and present a flat floor with um, with our tie down rails in it. So if you wanted to put a pallet in here to do a logistics mission or uh, an EMS mission or even a, a police mission, a power, power public mission, we believe the vehicle will be ready for that given its, um, its modular design. Our demonstrator will be fully autonomous. It will not uh, have a pilot on board. And uh, the combination of Garmin and Thales uh, will set the foundation for the vehicle management system, the vehicle management computer, which is kind of the central brain that tells you, you know, where and what we're trying to do, and then the flight control computer that tells you how we're going to do it through our control laws and the, the interaction between that computer on, and the control surfaces outside. Now, we also have um, system integration labs we're setting up, and, and those are running uh, so that we understand the elect electronics, the avionics, and the mm -hmm. flight control computers and how they interact with each other. And then we have an autonomy sill as well at Bell where we're studying the autonomous uh, uh, capabilities of the vehicle and the interface between how much is on the vehicle and how much is on the ground. You know, there's this whole debate around can we create a deterministic system that's still autonomous or automated versus a non-deterministic system. The non-deterministic systems are hard to certify. And if you think of the ultimate autonomy goals, that it might be true that they're non-deterministic because they have behavioral type capabilities. But you know, initially we need to find a deterministic system that combines the onboard autonomy, the infrastructure external to the aircraft that helps you with flight and navigation and emergency response to contingencies, and then we can have a deterministic system like we do now. Um, so I'm worried about that. Um, sensors, you know, sensors need to have, you know, better range. Uh, the computers that are going to, you know, look at all that data have to have better latency and, and comp computational um, power. Um, although, you know, that that's, um, you know, pretty easy to get. Uh, but the sensors need to be smartly integrated, understanding their limits. Yeah and understanding how they interact with any given aircraft configuration. Wrong vehicle, sometimes the vehicle has to make the choice I know. to save the passenger yeah. or to save the outside person. Do yeah. you have the same kind of... Operation? No, there's much, um, there's, there are, I call those the moral conundrums of autonomy on the ground. Those don't exist in the air, it's binary. You do not connect, you do not hit anything or do hit something. So that's the first nice part about it. The other nice part is we'll be interfacing initially with professionally trained pilots, not amateur drivers like us. 
And then the third piece is, you'll ask, what about during takeoff and getting to the ground? That's where we have to have predefined known offshoots so that if something were to happen and the autonomous system needed to land, it would already know based on its position in the route where it had to go. And then the sensor pack would take over to make doubly sure that area is clear and then land. So we're already, you know, the apt vehicle back here, it already flies fully autonomously for us. So all of our learning there is helping us develop the system for this. But it's, it, you heard me say again, it's a combination of the vehicle and the infrastructure in the airspace and on the ground. That's the smartest way to get that done in a safe manner. And safety is number one for us. It's, 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 a, it's a really exciting time. Um, our industry is changing uh, like it's never changed you know, since maybe the jet age came in. Uh, and that's just a wonderful time to be a part of this. And, and I'm not saying there's not challenges, um, but it's becoming a when question, not an if question anymore.